Welcome to Starbound, where every star tells a story. What happens when Earth's last hope in a cosmic game of chess is a young prodigy playing not just for victory, but a humanity's right to exist? Let's get into the story. The sleek and possibly made ship Galorax Dreadnought hovered over Earth, a stark testament to the alien empire's technological dominance. When the transmission finally crackled to life, the Galorax emissary's voice dripped with amusement, not malice. This wasn't a declaration of war, it was an invitation to a cosmic game of chess. The rules were standard, but the board, well, that was another matter entirely. A single solar system would serve as the playing field, asteroids would become pawns, moons would morph into bishops and rooks, battle cruisers and destroyers would take the roles of royal pieces, and reigning supreme dreadnoughts would be the kings, the most potent symbols of power in either of their fleets. The stakes were laid bare with the terrifying simplicity of those who hold absolute power. If Earth lost, annihilation. If they somehow won, the Galorax would share technological secrets that would catapult humanity centuries ahead of its current stumbling among the stars. The choice, the emissary had sneered, was obvious. Obvious, perhaps, to the Galorax. To humanity, it was a suicide note inked on cosmic scales. Yet there was no choice. A clock was ticking. Earth had one lunar cycle to select its champion and prepare. Those ill-fated individuals would not be merely playing a game. They would become the generals of a war fought not with lasers and missiles, but with gambits and sacrifices. Panic surged globally, then simmered down into a cold resignation. This wasn't even a fair fight. The Galorax would play with the bored confidence of a master toying with a novice. What sliver of hope could humanity possibly cling to? Yet hope, irrational and impossible, was all they had left. The world's greatest chess players were summoned, brilliant minds, but used to the 64 squares of their wooden boards, not the infinite expanse of space dotted with celestial bodies heavy enough to crush their home in an indifferent cosmic sigh. The search widened, becoming frantic. Surely there had to be someone, somewhere, who could grasp the enormity of this task, who could see the galaxy in the confines of the chessboard. One name resurfaced time and time again. Robert Fisher, Grandmaster, Legend, recluse. A decade ago, he had vanished at the precipice of his career, a devastating scandal stripping him of titles and glory. Rumors swirled, match-fixing, performance-enhancing drugs, even darker whispers of mental collapse. Fisher had become an enigma, and now humanity prayed that the tarnished genius might be their savior. The man they found was a shadow of chessboard royalty. Fisher's once luxurious estate was overgrown, windows webbed with cracks, he answered the door himself, gaunt, eyes haunted by the ghost of some great failure. He refused at first, voice rough with disuse. I'm done. Chess, it's, it's just a game. These stakes. He gestured vaguely towards the sky, where the looming dreadnought served as a constant, crushing reminder. Yet in the depths of his eyes, a spark glimmered. It was despair, yes, but also a predatory glint. The intellect of a master gamesman starved for a worthy challenge. Fisher wasn't Earth's only hope. A brilliant but rebellious astrophysicist named Dr. Maya Rao was reluctantly dragged from her laboratory. She saw galaxies rather saw chess pieces, theorizing about slingshot maneuvers and manipulating gravity wells in ways that made the seasoned military strategist balk and listen in awe. Fisher eyed her with grudging respect. Her cosmic perspective was alien to him, but he couldn't deny its potential power. The final member of their unlikely triumvirate was Fleet Admiral Yu Jun Park, a woman whose steely gaze and scarred hands spoke of decades spent in the unforgiving blackness of space. It fell to her to translate Fisher's strategic brilliance and Rao's audacious gambits into maneuvers their hastily assembled fleet could execute or die trying. Tension sparked from the start. Fisher, accustomed to being the sole chess master, bristled under Rao's disregard for chess tradition. Park, pragmatic and direct, clashed with them both, demanding clarity over abstract theory. The Galorax dreadnought hung silently in orbit, its very existence forcing them to work together or submit to oblivion before the first pawn had even moved. The first match was a disaster. 
The Galorax didn't merely win, they crushed Earth with a contemptuous ease that bordered on an insult. Every tentative advance by the human fleet was countered with brutal efficiency. For every asteroid pawn Earth lost, the Galorax countered with the swift annihilation of a cruiser. Within hours, the celestial chessboard painted a grim picture of absolute domination. In the control room hidden deep within the Cheyenne Mountain, a bone-deep chill settled upon the human observers. This wasn't a chess match, it was a massacre. Humanity seemed woefully unprepared to grasp the scale of the game, the ruthless tactical mind of their opponent. Fisher was the first to break the silence. It wasn't an analysis, but a confession of failure. They're playing at a level I can't comprehend, he muttered, the tortured brilliance of the past flickering behind his defeated gaze. Rao, however, had no time for despair. They're tacticians, not visionaries, she retorted passionately. They exploit openings, but they don't create them. We need to change the game, force them to react rather than dictate. Admiral Park, ever the pragmatist, translated the clash of ideas into brutal reality. We're going to lose pieces, she stated flatly. Her voice was devoid of sentimentality, only cold calculation. The question is, how do we lose them to our maximum advantage? Fisher was aghast. Sacrifice his pieces intentionally? The very thought ran counter to everything Chess had taught him. Yet looking at the grimly unfolding match, the fading remnants of Earth's fleet scattered across a solar system turned cosmic battlefield, he knew Rao was right. It was that or forfeit without a fight, surrender without even a whimper of defiance. His next words were barely a whisper. A gambit then? He looked up, meeting Rao's eyes for the first time with something resembling respect. Not a sacrifice but an invitation. We must bait them into a position so advantageous that they cannot refuse, and then... Then Park would have to capitalize on the fleeting opportunity, using whatever remained of their crippled fleet to strike hard and true at the heart of the exposed Galorax formation. It was a desperate plan born of a realization as chilling as the void of space itself. They were already losing. The best they could hope for was to lose strategically. The revised plan was a masterpiece of audacity and desperation. Humanity would offer the Glorex a gift, a tantalizing vulnerability disguised as blunder. The linchpin was a seemingly unprotected battlecruiser, a glistening prize positioned just beyond the reach of the Glorex's primary assault force. The comically oversized dreadnought of the Glorex commander shifted into position, the prelude to the swift strike designed to capture the Queen. The transmission from the Glorex was almost pitying laced with the arrogance of a victor toying with its prey. Fisher and Rao held their breaths. Every fiber of chess tradition screamed at Fisher that the sacrifice was a horrendous mistake. Rao, with her uncanny view of gravitational tides and orbits, bitter lip. The battlecruiser was isolated, the trap so very obvious, but both knew Park had no choice. Humanity's fate now rested in the Admiral's hands. Park had spent her life in the calculated ballet of fleet maneuvers, this was something else entirely. Her voice was steady as she initiated the sequence. Battlecruiser Atria, advance on Vector 319. All other units, defensive positions. The Atria was a queen walking into the jaws of a lion, yet it glided forward, its course a calculated provocation. On the bridge of the Galorak ship, a ripple of surprise, and then laughter. To them, this was a futile gesture of resistance, the death throes of a defeated species. The Galorix commander wasted no time, ordering a full strike force to converge on the lone battle cruiser. He could taste victory, a triumph so easy it was almost distasteful. It was precisely the arrogance Fisher and Rao had been banking on. As the Galorix converged on the Atria, they unknowingly maneuvered themselves directly into the heart of Park's own meticulously crafted trap. A daring slingshot maneuver around a dwarf moon massed until the perfect moment, and Ursa destroyers rained a deadly fire upon the exposed rear flank of the Galorax battle group. The audacious gambit paid off handsomely. Galorax ships fell from formation, their shields flickering and faltering under the unexpected onslaught. It was chaos, glorious chaos in the previously well-ordered ballet of destruction that had characterized the match. Back at Cheyenne Mountain, cheers erupted, yet Fisher, even amidst the unexpected success, felt a gnawing unease. It was too easy. They're retreating. He murmured, eyes glued to the shifting tactical display. 
True enough, the remaining Galorak ships were regrouping, pulling out of Earth's retaliatory strike range that felt more like a strategic repositioning than panicked flight. Rao saw it too. They weren't ready, she said. It caught them off balance, but that won't last long. They'll adapt, Fisher agreed grimly. Their moment of advantage was already fading. The confirmation wasn't long in coming. The Galorak's counterattack wasn't a mere reprisal. It was an orchestrated lesson in advanced strategy. They targeted Earth's remaining asteroid pawns, not with overwhelming force, but with pinpoint strikes calculated to splinter humanity's defensive line. What had begun as a desperate gambit now threatened to unravel completely. They see the board differently. Fisher hissed through gritted teeth. He hated the grudging admiration in his own voice. Every move the Galorax made seemed calculated not merely to win the individual battle, but to expose the fatal gaps in Earth's understanding of the cosmic game. It was, Fisher realized with a sickening lurch, checkmate in slow motion. A border flagship, Admiral Park, fought tooth and nail. Every desperate order was a last-ditch attempt to stem the relentless Galorax tide. Her fleet, once a symbol of human defiance, was now a dwindling constellation of battered ships desperately trying to hold the line. Earth needed a miracle. Miracles, Fisher had realized long ago, don't simply happen. You have to engineer them. The problem was, he wasn't sure if they had enough pieces left on the ravaged board for another desperate play. His gaze drifted to the far edge of the system. There, lurking like watchful beasts, were three Earth battleships, the last of their capital ship reserves. They had been stationed there intentionally as a contingency in case the Galorics launched a surprise attack vector. Now, well, they were useless, too far away from the main battle to make any decisive impact. Or were they? An idea began to take shape in Fisher's mind, a gamble so audacious, so utterly counter to his chest instincts that it made his blood run cold. Dr. Rao, he began hesitantly, hating the uncertainty in his voice. Humor me for a moment. Can you calculate a slingshot vector for our battleships? One that, he fumbled for the right words, one that uh, would bring them into play at an unconventional angle? Rao blinked in surprise, then her eyes widened as she caught his drift. It wasn't just insane, it was a flagrant violation of every established principle of interstellar fleet tactics. Yet she understood they had nothing left to play but insane moves. Her fingers danced across the astrophysics interface, tracing arcs of motion and probability. It's possible, she finally said, a manic energy buzzing in her voice. It's risky, unpredictable, and it'll throw them straight through the heart of the Galorex Reserve Armada. It was suicide, glorious and undeniable, but suicide, Fisher believed, with grim purpose, could be leveraged into a lethal distraction. Admiral, Fisher hated how frail his voice sounded, and he pressed on. I need those battleships to play decoy. Admiral Park didn't hesitate. She'd long since passed the point of questioning, trusting the desperate glint in her civilian strategist's eyes. Orders flashed out, crisp, devoid of sentiment. Earth's last battleships, pride of a fleet now mostly space debris, surged into motion. Their course was a knife thrust aimed at the vulnerable underbelly of the Galorax reserve fleet. By all rules of war, they were doomed, outgunned, unsupported. Their charge was tantamount to ramming speed into an unyielding wall. And that was precisely the point. On the Galorax dreadnought, alarm shrieked, first surprised, then dismissive. This wasn't a strategic move, it was bravado, the final furious gesture of a cornered animal. The Galorax counter was brutal, utterly focused on obliterating the rogue battleships. The focus shifted, ships maneuvered, ignoring Earth's crippled main fleet, their overwhelming firepower turned upon the perceived easy prey. Fisher and Rao had their opening. Night to E4. Fisher stated, his voice tight with the tension of a high-wire walk. There were no real knights, of course. It was a designation for a destroyer, the most nimble unit left in their armada. The only one with a prayer of executing the maneuver he had in mind. The destroyer surged forward, its course seemingly random, nonsensical on the vast battle map spread before them. Yet it was the first part of a chain reaction, Faint, counterfaint, culminating in the most devastating move in the arsenal of any chess player, human or alien. A pin. 
The Galorex battlecruiser, a piece worth twice their nimble destroyer, suddenly found itself in the line of fire from a hidden Earth gravity well generator. It was a gargantuan gravitational lens, a relic of a long-abandoned terraforming project, now repurposed by Rao's genius into a weapon of opportunity. The mighty Galorex ship was trapped, unable to fire upon Earth's battleship decoys without risking catastrophic damage from its own heavy weapons hitting another Galorex ship. Check. Not quite checkmate, but it was the closest they'd come in this deadly game. The pin was a disruption, a crack in the Galorex's previously unassailable armor. It wasn't victory, but it bought them something equally precious. Time. Fisher was playing the long game now, not just for the survival of his world, but to reveal his opponent. Every Galorex countermove, every adjustment, exposed their strategic mindset a little more. The Galorex, with their effortless victories until now, had played a straightforward, ruthlessly efficient game. It was how an overwhelming force traditionally won. You crushed your opponent with superior firepower and tactical brilliance. But Earth had never had that luxury. Now their gambits, however costly, had introduced an unquantifiable element into the match. Unpredictability and desperation. On the Galorex Dreadnought, the mood had soured from amusement to icy anger. There was even a grudging respect, though the Galorex commander would never admit it. These humans were proving surprisingly tenacious. Yet it was still just tenacity. They were fighting well, yes, but they weren't winning. Every Earth Gambit was analyzed, every trap dissected. The Galorax counter-strategy relied on their deep technological superiority. They began deploying jamming ships, designed to scramble comms between Earth's scattered units. A drone attack, swift and lethal, wiped out a repurposed gravity generator, freeing their pinned battlecruiser, albeit at the cost of several drones. Earth's battlefield was shrinking and their tactical options narrowed with every passing minute. Back at the Cheyenne Mountain hub, Fisher's gambits had yielded only more losses and a slowly tightening Galorax noose around their necks. He was beginning to believe their miracle had been a mirage after all. But then, he saw it. A pattern emerging from the seemingly reactionary Galorax moves. They weren't merely countering, they were setting a trap of their own. His moment of bleak clarity was interrupted by a transmission from the Galorax Dreadnought. This time, there was no amusement in the alien commander's voice, only a chilling finality. The game is over. The message crackled through. You have fought adequately. Surrender and your suffering will be minimized. Fisher slammed a fist onto the tactical display. A constellation of shattered ships now blinked where humanity's last armada had valiantly fought. He thought of the sacrifices, the gambits that had cost them so dearly, only to leave them further behind than they'd started. Rao, however, seemed lost in thought, a frown creasing her usually stoic features. But why? she murmured. It wasn't a plea for understanding, but a strategist's query. Why would a superior force offer any concessions? Admiral Park battle-grimed and weary voiced the unspoken question. Fisher, your play? He looked up, the haunted brilliance back in his eyes, touched with a desperate resolve. Not a conventional one. We surrender. He saw the shock register on the faces of Park and Rao, but held up a hand to stem their protest. But, he emphasized, we're not conceding the match. It was a contradiction, a, a paradox. Yet he saw the way Rao's frown morphed into a calculating glint. It was madness, but the chessboard was no place for sanity anyway. Transmission to the Galorax, Fisher ordered. His voice was steady, almost eerily calm compared to the maelstrom raging within him. We concede the military conquest. You have proven your superiority in that theater. We are prepared to submit to your terms. However, the chess match remains unfinished. The reply from the Galorax came with bewildering speed. Arrogance bled through static-filled transmissions. The game is concluded. Your surrender implies forfeit. Not the rules we agreed upon, Fisher countered evenly. Our surrender means the cessation of active hostilities. The match itself continues until checkmate is achieved. It was a semantic loophole they'd built into their initial contract with the Galorax, a detail that seemed irrelevant at the time. 
Now it was their last tenuous lifeline. It was a desperate attempt to manipulate the Galorax's own pride, the absolute certainty of superior intellect. They had to take the bait. They had to believe Checkmate was inevitable, and their victory so complete that indulging this final play was beneath contempt. Silence hung heavy in the control room. Every human present understood their actions would determine the fate of their species. The Galorax transmission crackled back, filled with cold amusement. Very well. You may continue your... play. But know this, humans. Your pieces dwindle, and your king is exposed. It is merely a matter of time. Earth's king. The last dreadnought was now a lone, defiant relic surrounded by wreckage. The remainder of their tattered fleet had withdrawn to shield it as best they could, sacrificing themselves move by move, trying to buy their king a few extra moments of existence. It was futile. Any competent chess player could see that, let alone a tactical mind of the Galorax's caliber. But Fisher saw something different. His surrender had shifted something profoundly. The board wasn't just the battlefield anymore. It was now a warped reflection of Earth itself, ravaged, teetering on the brink, but with a stubborn core of resistance that refused to be extinguished. He finally understood. Checkmate, Fisher said, his voice ringing clear into the stunned silence of the command room. Checkmate in eight moves. He began to visualize the moves out loud, not with the traditional chess notation, but translating them into desperate, last-ditch maneuvers for the remnants of their shattered fleet. They would continue to be lambs led to the slaughter, each sacrifice meticulously calculated, but in their dying, they would strike at the heart of the Galorax's ego, their belief in their unassailable position, their utter contempt for humanity's defiance. It was a gambit born not of strategic brilliance, but the purest, most primal instinct of survival. A cornered animal not just lashing out, but striking with deadly intent at the most vulnerable spot. For even in the grim certainty of defeat, humanity would fight until its last defiant breath, and perhaps... Just perhaps, the Galorax would stumble in their arrogance. Fisher commanded a damaged dreadnought to charge at the Galorax fleet. Move one. The following sequences played right into Fisher's plan. Ignoring the damaged dreadnought, thinking it was no threat, the Galorax moved forward, looking to take checkmate on their own. Not realizing this was all part of the trap before long, the remaining human fleet swung around a near asteroid and focused fire on their own dreadnought, laden with a payload, enough to blow up a planet, now close enough to the Galorax fleet to make a dent in not only their pride, but the fleet itself, their queen exposed and in the perfect position to feel the full might of human desperation. The dreadnought went up, and with it like fireworks in the sky, so did most of the Galoraxian fleet, not a single ship escaping harm. However, the Queen reacted in the most spectacular way. Taking a large hit from the explosion, it seemed to survive. However, debris catapulted from the explosion found its way to the fusion core. This was followed by an implosion of the fusion core before the biggest firework humanity has ever seen went off. The sudden devastation of the Queen ripped through the Galorax fleet like wildfire. Their rigid formation shattered, replaced by desperate, uncoordinated scrambling. Amidst the chaos, the Galorax King, their towering command ship, stood shockingly vulnerable. It was the moment Earth had bled for. Now the fleet looked to finish the King, checkmate now almost guaranteed. Taking large hits, it was like a sitting duck. However, no chances were being taken. Humanity was taken to the brink. Now wasn't the time to squander this opportunity on arrogance. The Galorax King, symbol of their absolute dominance, buckled under the onslaught. Its shield strained beyond capacity, flared and died. Explosions bloomed across its hull, ripping vital systems apart. Whether in a final burst of fiery defiance or a crippling system failure, the Galorax command ship detonated, the flames washing over the battlefield. The heart of the Galorax armada was gone. In its place, scattered debris and a dying dreadnought, a testament to a Pyrrhic victory, bought with the blood of millions. 
but a victory nonetheless. Humanity against impossible odds. Fisher turned, and the last thing he muttered, Checkmate.